Hello, you weirdos. It looks like you've come to the same place as me to listen to some horror filmmakers, actors, and writers tell real-life spooky stories. What you may not know is all these people are actually guests on our new online show, The Grim Exchange, which starts November 13th, that is Friday the 13th. So make sure to subscribe and return to this channel when we air our very first episode of The Grim Exchange and present to you the latest of horror entertainment news. Have fun and please have a happy Halloween. What's going on everybody? This is DeAndre Teagle and this is my spooky story. So, I am the oldest sibling in my family and we grew up with a single mother so it was my responsibility sometimes to watch over my younger brother and sister while my mom was at work. One night my brother is at a friend's house so it's just me and my baby sister. It's about time for bed. Uh, my baby sister is in her bedroom. She's asleep. I'm sitting on the couch. I can see my sister's room from here. So there are steps and then her room is the first bedroom on the right. So I'm sitting down. I'm watching the classic movie, I, Robot, starring Will Smith. Yes, it's a classic. And I want to go grab something from the kitchen, uh, you know, to snack on. So I press pause on the movie, go grab the snack. I'm about to sit down, about to press play, but then, then I hear a grown man's voice come from my sister's room and it says, I wouldn't do that. So I drop my snack. I'm mad now, but I think it was like beef jerky. Beef jerky is on the floor. It's ruined. Um, I'm really mad about that. And I just sit there. My heart fell into my stomach. And I look up to my sister's bedroom. Nobody's moving. She's asleep. And then I hear it again. I wouldn't do that. So the second time, I called my mom. I said, Mom, I just heard a grown man's voice come out of my sister's room. I don't want to be here alone. Uh, what should I do? And she said, well, why don't you just go in there and see if your sister's asleep? I said, uh, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm saying right here, I'm not about to go. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you heard that right. I was going to leave my sister in there with what evil spirit was chilling with her. So I said, uh, I'm not about to do that. So I called my sister. I said, Ari, her name's Ariana. Ariana. And she says, yeah, I'm awake. So one or two things happened. There was an evil spirit in there chilling with my sister and she was cool with it. Or two, she was possessed for a little bit. Um, to this day, I don't know which one it was. Happy Halloween. I hope y'all stay safe. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, I went on holiday with my family and my brother and my dad and I were walking and we saw across the fields, we were in the Peak District, we saw there was like a little hill was surrounded by trees. So um, one day we thought we'd go and explore this little hill surrounded by trees. And so my brother, my dad and I, and the sun's going down and it's also lovely and bucolic. And we get to the, the perimeter. My brother won't go in, which is a bit weird. He's something's not quite right about the place for him. And all of the animals in the fields won't go near it either. So which feels strange, but you know, you press on. So my dad and I sort of get into this um, in enclosure and find the little hill and it's overgrown no one's been there for ages we sort of work our way up a little path right the way through to the top we're both feeling like a little bit weird i think okay maybe it's just time to, to go get it go get out of here this is not a very nice place and then we turn to go round, and actually the path that we'd come up we can't find again so we spent ages even though the hill's like 10 meters by 20 meters we spent ages coming down this hill and trying to find a way out it's getting darker it's getting darker it's getting darker. my brother's outside really really spooked so eventually we get out of the thing thinking that's weird and we go home and we look on a map and it says that it's a tumulus and then we look at what a tumulus is and a tumulus is a burial mound and we'd all felt this don't come in here thing in different ways and indeed once we we're in it felt like it tried to keep us in there and yeah so that's the story. Hey Grimfest, Kevin Roethlisberger here. Uh, I do have a scary story one involves when I was 18 years old. Um, I was at a friend's house who actually lived right across the street from me, classic friend across the street type story. And his parents were out of town. And 18 years old, you have a whole house to yourself. You know how that goes. You invite every single one of your friends over. So there was about maybe 10 of us all in that house. And I lived obviously across the street. So I ran over and when he told me he had everybody uh, over at his house, we get in there and 
we're just looking for mischief, basically. Like, what do you want to do? We were too young to be able to buy our own booze. Even if we were able to get some, you weren't, you know, that didn't last long. And what else are you going to do? So we decided, um, hey, they were like, Kevin, we remember a story from when you were a kid that you told us. You know how to make a homemade Ouija board, don't you? And I remember, um, I won't go into it, but I had a really bad experience when I was a kid with one with some street rat friends that I had that we did it up in an abandoned house once. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, come on, make it. And I was like, I'm not going to make it, but I can. I was dumb. I said, I'll tell you how to make it. So I told them how to make a homemade Ouija board. And we used the shot glass instead of the 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 uh, the guider. And um, next thing you know, uh, they're asking it these questions and yada, yada, yada. And things are going on and um, things start to start picking up. And we notice that the shot glass is starting to move and they're not even touching it. Well, they keep asking it more questions. Some of it's childish, some of it's kind of disrespectful. And then finally they started asking normal, um, almost personal questions. And then, you know, then we noticed that the, the mood in the room just kind of changed and everything got real quiet and we had candles lit. And this is all in the kitchen, mind you. This is all in the kitchen, the heart of the house. And next thing you know, it starts moving and spelling out letters. And I look at, and, I, and I'm been down. I'm not touching it, by the way. I told her I was not going to touch the, the Ouija board. They could do it. I wasn't going to do it. But I, so I, I'm on the side noticing more of, of some things, intri intrinsic, the in, in, intricate things that they couldn't. And I'm looking down and I'm noticing there's a shot glass right above, below their fingers. Their fingers aren't even touching it maybe that much of a gap and the shot glass is moving and their hands are hovering over it and they're asking who's moving and who's moving it. And I said, guys, no one's even touching the shot glass. And it was starting to guide, but their energy from their hands were kind of hovering over it, guiding it. Next thing you know, it starts spelling out some words. I kind of forget, but it was a very eerie moment. Well, I noticed they were all, they're like, okay, what's the next question we should ask? Well, as they're, as they're uh, debating on what's the next good question they should ask it, I'm watching the Ouija board and I'm noticing that it's, it slowly moves over to nine. And then as they're talking, they're not even, their hands are hovering above it and they're not even paying attention to the shot glass, but I am watching. It starts going from nine to eight to seven to six to five and right when I got there I was like I said guys guys watch 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 they're looking at it, it says four three and I said I said that thing's counting down say goodbye say goodbye it went to two and then they instantly went whoa and they said goodbye well and I said okay I'm out of here that was it for me so I left the house well I get a call from about an hour later I get a call from my friend Tom calls me and he's like, dude, can I come over and spend the night? I'm like, are you still at Tim's? He's like, yeah. And he's not the type of guy that asks to come spend the night. He's very kind of closed off kind of friend, you know? And I'm like, sure. I knew something was up. We well, came over to the house and he said that right after I left that the, um, <laughs> the energy in the house completely changed and that all the lights on the house completely turned off, completely. This was after I left. And they heard giant stomps and slams in the basement. Like, <laughs> they all freaked out, ran downstairs, looked through each little room that was in the basement. They found nothing, no one down there. And then they started hearing all throughout the house, going up the steps, running across, the temperature dropped like five degrees and 10 degrees in the house, almost something like that. And uh, my friend came over to spend the night and I was like, dude, I don't want, you might've brought some energy with you. Here's where it gets a little weird, if it wasn't weird enough. He stays the night with me in the room. 
we both wake up and I feel, it feels like something's pushing down on my chest. I'm like, I can barely breathe. Breath is coming. You can see my breath in my room. And I look over, I look over at Tom and he's wide awake. And he looks up at me because he was sleeping on the ground. And he goes, dude, I can't breathe. And I said, I can't either. And I said, it's freezing in here. And he goes, yeah. And I was like, oh my God. I look over at the clock. It's exactly 3 a.m. The witching hour. I got out of my bed and I ran down the hall and uh, went to my mom and woke her up. And as a good Irish Catholic mom, instantly said, I told her what happened. I was freaking out. Mom, we, uh, we played with a Ouija board earlier. She's like, you what? You know. Imagine uh, your good practicing Irish Catholic mom hearing that news. So what does she do? She instantly grabs uh, the weapon of choice that she knows, which is the Holy Rosary. She grabs the rosary, goes into my room with us, chewing us out the whole time, how stupid we are, how we should never be playing with something like that. She prays the rosary in the room. Uh, the whole thing was about 25 minutes. After that, the temperature went back to normal and the room and the, the energy in the room completely changed. It was done. It was done. Nothing was weird for the rest of the night. But um, I'll never forget that. That was real. And I have 10 other witnesses that witnessed that. So that's my scary story. Happy Halloween. Uh, a more interesting dream that I had I involved my therapist. And uh, I, I was seeing her the next day. So I thought, oh, this is why I had this dream about her. So I got on the call with her and I said, um, yeah, I had this dream. I've never been to your apartment before in New York City, but um, I dreamt that it was on the ground floor, which is strange. Why would you live on the ground floor? And there was the, the desk with the doorman and your door was right behind the front desk, which is also kind of strange. Um, and, uh, and I went inside and you were trying wigs on and all the wigs were exactly the same as your hair. And you gave me one and I tried on one and you tried on one. And then you pulled this mannequin out and you were touching this mannequin. And I thought it was gonna be like a sexy weird thing at first, but it wasn't. And you were talking to it, it was very strange. And then all of a sudden you said, I have to go. And you ran out the door and, and I screamed after, I'll, I'll lock up for you. And my therapist is laughing when I'm telling her this. And she says, well, I know you've never been to my apartment, but..." I do live on the ground floor. I said, oh, wow. And she says, yes, and I do live behind the front desk. It, it, it does go around and that's where I live. I went, oh my God. She goes, yeah. She goes, um, what's even more strange is when I was living in Japan, I got into a very bad car accident. Um, one of the tires just exploded, uh, came off, and I was just rolling down and ended up in someone's front yard and hitting, um, I don't know if she, she hit the house or a tree or something. So she kind of got her bearings and thought, well, I've got to go in and tell these people and also try and get a phone. So she knocks on the door and these two children answer the door. And um, she said, um, uh, is, is your mother home? And they nodded, yes. She said, um, could, I, could I come in? I said, yes. So they opened the door and she said, um, where's your mother? And they pointed to a room, a door that was closed. So she said, I walk over and I open the door and there was a mannequin. The family had left the mannequin to watch the children. When I was around nine years old, I it was a, a wedding with some friends of the family. We were at this uh, like working men's club up in Oldham where I'm from. So this working men's club I had the reception, everyone's in there drinking and dancing and it was right next to a church with a graveyard. Now being a young like nine year old boy and there was other kids there and stuff, we were getting bored inside while the adults danced and got drunk. So me and this other kid, I think he was called Daniel. Um, he was a year or two older than me. We snuck out of the working men's club and we saw this graveyard and thought, oh, let's go and have a look in the graveyard. And it was spooky as shit. It was nighttime. Um, it was lit up by all the, by street lamps only, you know, so, so we walk down this path in the graveyard and there was a door on the side of the church, huge wooden door with a stone archway over it. And then two sides, 
So on both sides of the, the archway, these two faces were hewn into the stone. I look up at one of the faces and it was crying. It was blubbering, like, <laughs> and there were tears rolling down its face, not water on top of the, the brick, like the brick itself was, was tears. I looked at the other face and it was also doing it. And I didn't say a word to Daniel. I was spooked. I looked at him, he looked at me and he said, do those faces look like they're crying to you? And we fucking ran. We legged it back inside. So yeah, I think that's the only supernatural experience I've ever had. We, we both saw stone faces cry. Gone back to that church as an adult and I've stood in front of that same door and seen though those faces are still there, but I've, I've never seen them cry since it was just that time. So I don't know what that means, but it was spooky as fuck. Making horror movies, obviously you end up in places <laughs> that are creepy um, because you want to find the best locations for your horror movie. So uh, I have occasionally had weird experiences in the strange places I've been you know, old manor houses and old castles. But anyway, I was shooting this movie called The House of Violent Desire. Um, and we were in the south of France in this huge medieval castle. Um, and this was just a location recce. So I was going around this castle. Um, I was by myself at this particular time when this happened. Um, I went into this room uh, and the whole place had a kind of a, a kind of <laughs> ominous feel to it. And it's, you know, it was a bedroom full of furniture, beds, and then there was a doorway, big cabinets, you know, everywhere. And as I walked out of the door and closed the door behind me and the door shut, um, suddenly I heard the loudest bang, like, like the whole floor shook from, from the, uh, <laughs> the impact of this. And I thought, shit, as I've, as I've walked out of the room, I've like knocked something or I've stood on a wobbly floorboard and like there's a big glass cabinet by the door. I was certain that this cabinet had just literally toppled over and slammed down on its front. Uh, I was like, it, it was that loud, the floor shook. And I was like, oh damn it. I went back in the room, nothing had moved in the whole room. Like everything was exactly as I'd left it. So where that sound came from, I have no idea. And I was the only person in the castle at that particular time. So I can't explain that. And then for the rest of the shoot, uh, we called that the haunted room and the haunted cabinet. And in fact, we all played games on each other by <laughs> putting uh, strange items that belong to each other. We'd, we'd sort of put these items in the cabinet and pretend that some sort of demon was stealing them. But uh, it was freaky. I didn't even see that the last time. They accidentally leave that door open a lot. So. <laughs> Have you been in there? Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty creepy though because the door creaks shut when you're in there and so you run. Whoa. <laughs> so Courtney, Seaside Shadows does tours of Elm Grove Cemetery. How old is this cemetery? Yes, yeah, so the cemetery dates to 1854. It was part of the rural landscape cemetery movement during the Victorian era, where their goal was to make cemeteries parks that you could picnic in and fly kites in. And also they were very romantic about death, so they wanted glorious cemeteries to show that. Mm -hmm. What are some of the stories that you've learned? In this cemetery, the founding people of Mystic, all the ship captains and sea merchants are here. Some of them are phenomenal in their personal history. There's one man who was a sea merchant, a gold miner, a Civil War prisoner who escaped on the Underground Railroad, and then he ends up exploding on a ship that gets struck by lightning. Oh. One of the first Irish immigrants to America is buried here. Lady Anne was her name, and she was what was considered part of the equivalent to a Miles Standish family of Mystic. There's some true crime murder victims in here. Ooh, There's just true crime. everything, you name it. Yeah, <laughs> it's in here. What's your favorite story, though? So my favorite stories are always a blend of history and mystery. 
And there's this old legend in Mystic that dates to the late 1800s, around the time the cemetery was built, about a woman named Lydia Palmer. And Lydia Palmer was engaged to a local sea merchant and fisherman, and she was a young lady. They were excited to be married, but they decided that they would be married after he finished one of his trips out at sea. And while he's out at sea and she's planning the wedding one night with her mother, it's dark, it's starting to rain outside, she gets this strange feeling and decides she's going to just look out the window and goes into a daydream. And as she's looking out the window, the rain is hitting the glass, and then all of a sudden, she shrieks in unimaginable horror, and she points at the window, kind of her hand and finger shaking, and her engagement ring falls off and hits the ground and snaps in two. And her mother runs over, asks her what's the matter, and Lydia confesses that she saw in the window the face of the man she was to marry, Mr. Sawyer, looking at her, but he was green and grisly, and she knew he had died. And her mother tried to reassure her, but the next day, Lydia wakes up, and two men are at her door telling her that her fiancé fell overboard in the storm she had witnessed outside, and that they were unable to recover his body. And she spent the rest of her life telling people that she saw a bad omen, that bad omens do come true, and we need to always be on the lookout for them. And she had people draw his face in history books, everything, you name it, and never married, making sure that she just dedicated her life to the night she saw her dead fiance's face in the window. And naturally, she would pass when she was older. And now she's one of the most famous ghosts of the Mystic Cemetery, isn't of Elm Grove, because people see a lady wandering in her wedding dress, calling out for her long lost love, Especially, they say she appears on stormy nights and things like this, waiting for him to return home. Do you know someone who's actually seen? She's been documented as seen by varying locals since the 1940s, and we've had a couple experiences on our tour where people, before I have even told them the story of her, have asked me who the lady is peeking out from behind the trees in the white dress. Oh. <laughs> Seaside Shadows, <laughs> the absolute best ghost stories and ghost tours in Mystic, Connecticut. Ilha